So the question is, uh, what role did the U.S. play in this? And it was a pretty direct supporting role. I happened to go to Rwanda just before this invasion took place. And, you know, major shipments of weapons were coming in at night to support the Rwandan army. We had placed uh, people in the country who were training Rwandan army troops. Uh, and in, in short, we were supporting the invasion. The United States, what they decided to do in the final analysis was to support an invasion of the Congo. In this case, you had Rwanda and Uganda invading their neighbor, plundering it of its natural resource wealth, and suffering no sanctions at the United Nations Security Council. And you have to ask why, and it's because uh, they had the very strong support and backing of the United States, United Kingdom, and other governments. The reason the United States supported Rwanda and Uganda in their invasion of Congo cannot simply be attributed to genocide guilt. The U.S. had economic and political motivations as well. One reason for our involvement extended back to our support of Mobutu Sisi Seko, a dictator we helped install in Congo and supported for 32 years. This man bled his country dry. He extracted even more money from it than King Leopold did in his time, but Mobutu had a longer reign and a much more developed economy to plunder. And the United States was deeply complicit in that because we supported Mobutu lock, stock, and barrel. But after the Cold War ended, essentially in 1989, 1990, many of his backers, including the United States government and the French government, essentially abandoned him. Uh, he became a liability to them because he had such a bad human rights record. When Mobutu became an embarrassment, we helped Rwanda and Uganda overthrow him and install another dictator, and another. Now the Congolese people are victims of a corrupt dictatorial network which receives financial support from the United States. They have looted the place outrageously, you know, taking hundreds of millions of dollars in minerals, sponsoring some of the worst warlords, and with never a protest from Washington. The role the U.S. plays in Central Africa is complex. Historically, we've maintained influence in the area for access to minerals on which our economy and military rely. But our connection to Rwanda serves our interests in yet another way. A problem here is really a problem of political will in the United States. Why is Rwanda and why are Uganda important to the U.S. military? Precisely because we can have them do things in Africa that we don't wish to do for ourselves. We can have their soldiers die if need be. We can have them deploy places if need be. And so having proxies, having allies, having clients who are willing to do your bidding becomes very important. The disciplined and organized armies of Rwanda and Uganda are useful for protecting American interests in Africa. Similarly, friendships with dictators are easier to manage than complex, thriving democracies. For generations, the way the United States has been involved in Central Africa has helped perpetuate tyranny and dependency. So, when you see these prescriptions coming out of Washington, and they say, well, we've tried everything, you know, we support peacekeepers, we've had peace talks, it's usually within the parameters of maintaining the current order. This has serious implications in terms of what people don't talk about, U.S. foreign policy. That's where the problem lies. He has something to do with the United States and Great Britain supporting strong men in Africa rather than supporting the people. Now, it's easy to point fingers and to pin the blame of these problems on others. Yes, a colonial map that made little sense helped to breed conflict. The West has often approached Africa as a patron or a source of resources rather than a partner. But the West is not responsible for the destruction of the Zimbabwean economy over the last decade. War, wars in which children are enlisted as combatants. But now, Obama, when he went to Ghana, 
he had a huge speech, you know, that really woke up Africans. You know, he, he was very harsh. He was almost as a dad telling the kids, you guys need to get your act together. You know, you can't have election here and spring some elections there and call that democracy. That was good for him to say that. Saying that, you know, he's demanding that there, there are some accountability for political leaders in Africa. But he said something that still sticks with me today. He said that America is ready to support strong institutions, but not strong men. Africa, Africa doesn't need strong men. It needs strong institutions. As for America and the West, our commitment must be measured by more than just the dollars we spend. I pledge substantial increases in our foreign assistance, which is in Africa's interests and America's interests. But the true sign of success is not whether we are a source of perpetual aid that helps people scrape by. It's whether we are partners in building the capacity for transformational change. So, there are a whole series of things that can be done, keeping in mind that the ultimate solution is going to come from the Congolese people themselves. Our role on the outside is to make sure that we create the space for them to solve and address the challenges that they face. There's a strong desire for democracy in Congo, with leaders poised to start fixing their country. But key to their success is international pressure on Rwanda and Uganda to stop their destructive intervention. President Obama seems to understand this. For years, he has been an advocate for Congo, and as a senator, he co-sponsored a law that outlines a comprehensive strategy for Congo to realize justice. But key elements of this law have not been fully implemented. So, President Obama wrote a law to support the Congo, signing into law in 2006 by George Bush, the president then, co-sponsored by the Secretary of State today. That law is the most comprehensive law you can think about when it comes to supporting the Congo. Now we have a law that says that the Secretary of State has the power to withhold aid to any nation deemed to be destabilizing the Congo if she has sufficient evidence that this country is doing so. We have so many evidence on Rwanda and Uganda, and we even have a leaked UN report that all the Secretary of State have to do is read it and say, okay, we are not going to support you. But since 2000, the United States have given Rwanda $1 billion. The leaked UN report is calling this government a genocidal government. Why is the United States supporting a genocidal government? And it doesn't have to be that way. You, don't, you do not have to slaughter millions of people to get access to the cobalt for your colored television, or access to the cobalt for your aerospace industry, or access to the copper for your automobile industry. All right, you're dealing with the economy. You want the coltan. Man, Congolese people don't eat coltan. Congolese people can't eat gold. Talk to the Congolese people. We're going to let you get the resources, but for God's sake, stop killing the people. Stop letting Rwanda, Uganda, and Joseph Kabila kill with impunity. The situation in the Congo is not just a Congolese issue. It's not just an African issue, but it's a global issue. It's a worldwide issue. Congo is a part of the second largest rainforest in the world. It's vital to the fight against climate change. If you're concerned about